Welcome. Uh, my name is Chris Jeffords. I'm Senior Vice President of Oxford Computer Group North America. And I'd like to welcome everyone to, the, to today's uh, webinar on identity inversion. Uh, today we're going to cover the transformation identity is experiencing as enterprises effectively consume cloud-based services and what that means to traditional IT. Um, during the course of the webinar, I'll briefly introduce Oxford Computer Group. I'll then, at that point, turn it over to James Cowling, our Chief Technology Officer. Uh, he'll guide you through some fresh thinking about identity management, what it means going into the future here. And uh, during the course of this webinar, feel free to type your questions um, into the question box, and we'll answer them as we can. So um, Oxford Computer Group, for those of you who do not know us, uh, we're a systems integrator and educator. We're focused specifically on identity and access device management solutions within the Microsoft Solution Stack and are the Partner of the Year Award winner in identity and security in the access space uh, for the past two years. Um, we author and deliver educational services online as well in the classroom. Uh, we've uh, instructed well, well over 6,000 students um, who have benefited from our experience uh, from what our consultants have learned uh, in the field as they live, breathe, and eat um, identity and access management day to day. We also provide consultive envisioning, uh, which helps organizations visualize a comprehensive identity and access management strategy. Uh, and at the same point, they get a very good idea of the benefits of such a strategy and that path forward. And with that strategy, uh, we help execute those integration plans. Um, and We've done this in well over 800 enterprise-wide deployments in many verticals across many geographies and multiple uh, organization sizes. In this space, we provide uh, professional as well as managed services, maintaining and supporting the infrastructure we've integrated for clients that wish to focus their resources on their core competencies. Um, we specialize in directory and federation, identity management and roles-based access control, directory cleanup and consolidation, strong off and device management, as well as data protection. The products we specialize in include Microsoft Active Directory, ADFS, Forefront Identity Manager, including the Behold Suite, uh, System Center, as it relates to identity and device management, AD Rights Management Service, along with Microsoft's other products that are included in the Enterprise Mobility Suite, including Azure Active Directory Premium, Intune, Azure Multi-Factor Authentication, and Azure Rights Management Services. We also have a partner ecosystem, as you can see across the bottom here, that, aug that uh, augments the Microsoft products that we integrate. These include StealthBits, Optimal IDM, Jamalto, HID, Titus, and many others. So with that, um, I would like to turn it over to James without further delay, and uh, he'll take you along this path of the identity inversion. Thank you, Chris. Good uh, morning, I guess, everybody, or afternoon, or possibly evening in some cases. Um, welcome. So, yeah, my name's Callan. I'm the CTO at Oxford Computer Group. And uh, in this webinar, I'd just like to report on some of the thinking that we've been doing quite commonly in conjunction with our enterprise customers and partners who are looking for increasingly solutions to rather more complicated problems than we've had in the past. So I wanted to just go through some of the what you might call the classical approaches to identity. This is not intended to teach grandmother to suck eggs, as they say. If you don't know anything at all about identity, then um, you can ask some questions. But I assume that you're all, to some extent, in the identity business. Uh, and we will be looking at some of the challenges that the classical approaches bring us. And I will just tell you what I mean by the inversion and see if you uh, find yourself uh, having the same sorts of thoughts that we're having. So what we're going to be doing is going through some some step-by-step -step simple architectures uh, representing very, very high level, not very technical, very, very high level approaches to handling identities. And at some point, I expect you'll recognize yourself or your customers or your, or your organization on this journey somewhere from simple to complicated. So let's get on with it and I'll see how we get on. So, um, clearly, I'm going to explain it in more detail in this presentation, but generally speaking, what I'm trying to suggest here is that instead of having, as we have had in the past, our central IT systems 
at the top of the picture, if you like, and all the other systems in our life hanging down off it. Increasingly, the central IT focus becomes a cloud-led focus. And we'll talk about what we mean by that as we go along. Um, we'll see the advantages of using the cloud and its technologies as we go along, but the, the sort of high, uh, high level ones are we can deal with high volumes of identities, so the sort of million scale identity uh, populations of, for example, customers or in some cases students or in some cases members of some organization. And uh, those are volumes that we find it rather hard to deal with with our historical on-premises systems. So we'll be looking at that. And uh, internal IT, of course, still has its very important high-value job to do, uh, and it will be connected to the authoritative cloud store, and it will consume identities from the cloud store. The good thing about using the cloud, of course, is its standards-based approach. Um, and historically, we, we were rather unkindly sometimes called our, our legacy systems. Those legacy systems quite often haven't been built using the, the standards that are what you might call modern, and that makes integrations between heterogeneous systems somewhat complicated. So let's have a look at it. I make no um, look from make a suspenseful presentation. So that's what I mean by the identity inversion. We're in trying to invert the picture, or seeing if inverting the picture brings us advantages. So we'll draw some pictures in a moment. This is that we'll be talking about. Um, provisioning and deprovisioning. So this is we're dealing with the creation and the management and the uh, the validation of user identities. So I'm not talking about authentication at this stage. I'm not talking about how to get people to log in. I'm merely talking about the fact that systems need user accounts and systems need user lists and systems need access to trusted identities in some way. Now different systems need different sorts of identities, of course, but we'll see that. So initially, what are we talking about? Provisioning and deprovisioning, creation of accounts in the appropriate place at the appropriate time, and the removal of them at the end of the user's useful life in the system. We're talking about permissions. So the management of permissions, in other words, the creation of those permissions, the removal of those permissions, but also the checking that those permissions are appropriate, so the attestation of those permissions. These are our classic activities. We're interested in managing passwords or other credentials, whether they be certificates or some sort of log on tokens or some other thing, but some sort of credential management. We spend, um, therefore, also some time with this multi factor authentication, so smart cards, tokens, SMS authentication to mobile phones, that sort of thing. Our life is very, very wrapped by audit needs. We have various controls that we must put in place to make clear to our lords and masters, whether that be government or regulators or just our bosses inside the organization or the audit, audit company that we use, that we have everything under control. So audit and reporting is important. And depending on the organization, the automation of all this stuff is, to some extent, automating tasks that previously were done at the service desk. The service desk isn't going to go away, though. So the service desk needs to be kept informed of what we're doing. And so we like to integrate with the service desk and make sure that they can see what the automated system has been doing. So we're, we are automating service desk activities, but we're integrating with them as well. So these are our classic, what we might call central IT themes. And let's just go through uh, some of the basic scenarios, the classic scenarios that we work with in central IT. I'll work with our internal employees, and we work with external or part-time employees, our contractors, and so on. And very commonly, we'll have some sort of external collab scenarios working with partners or suppliers or some sort of people who need access to shared content from outside of our private network. This is classically our external collab uh, scenario. So our identity management does those things which I've already really talked about. And quite commonly, um, if we want to do uh, authentication for all of these external users, for example, we try to have some sort of central instance, some sort of Active Directory or some sort of LDAP server that provides us with a central authentication instance. I realize that in the modern world that isn't the way we're talking about it, but historically this is the way central IT has managed its, its identity management and there's plenty of it about. So let's look at this. Now, in the scenarios you're about to see, we're talking about where to get identities from and how to manage them. And Traditionally, they're going to come out of some sort of HR system, our internal employees. There are organizations who manage their employees also internally via a variety of 
what local unconventional means, whether that be an Excel spreadsheet or directly into Active Directory, whatever. But in these classical scenarios, we're working with an HR system. And also classically, it's not unknown that our HR department also handles all of the activities around external contractors, but it's also very common. I would say the majority of the time, our external contractors are managed in a some sort of a portal UI, um, and that is our sort of authoritative source, some sort of self-service front end where our, either our IT department or possibly the heads of departments themselves can create, create uh, the contractors that they have working for them. We will see that complexity will increase. Uh, this is the burden of my song, that the world is becoming more complex. And the, the two dimensions that are of particular interest are these. Um, along the sort of business complexity dimension, if we have multiple business units who do similar but different sorts of business in similar but different geographies with similar but different needs for compliance and monitoring and so on, then we just have different requirements. And the more of that sort of differentiation between business units that we have, the more complex our system becomes. So that's one dimension. The other dimension is that we are increasingly being required to provide services to different user communities. And those different communities have different technical requirements and different process requirements. Let's have a look at what I mean. I thought there was another slide there, apologies. There was a list of communities at one point. Um, the communities uh, that I'm talking about might be uh, our internal and external employees, as well as our customers, as well as our students, and so on. I don't believe the slide is coming up later. So we'll come, come to our different user communities later. Uh, let's look at the, the simple scenario. So, let that come up. Okay. So it's a very, very simple environment. In the middle is our big box. That is our notional identity management platform. So from our standpoint, it's almost certainly going to be running FIM, Corporate Identity Manager from Microsoft. The discussion is reasonably valid regardless of the product. But uh, we have an on-premises system that is sitting there providing some sort of services. Their, their workflows, people are applying for things, they're approving things, they're saying that the existing rights are appropriate. And we're, to some extent, able to, to provide employee self-service, ESS services, allowing uh, employees to go and do their own thing as far as identity is concerned, creating contractor user accounts and so on. We've got a big green feed coming out of our ERP system that, broadly speaking, could be, could be anything but some sort of HR system providing us with our internal employees. And then the red line writing back to Active Directory, to a mail system, to databases, to whatever we need to be doing to automate the creation and management of user accounts based on their authoritative HR data that we're getting from the HR system. A very simple picture. So, a little bit more complexity. So, let's consider the contractors. So, over there, we've got a community of contractors who need to be managed in some way. I'm not going to really comment on what the process might be, but some user somewhere very commonly sits down and uses some custom UI, some web-based UI usually, to fill in a form and say, I need a temporary account for a contractor who will be working with us for the next eight weeks or whatever. And that then gets consumed by the identity management system and the same sorts of things apply, different sets of rules usually, but the same sorts of things happen. So that is a very simple scenario. These are all things that I suspect most of us on the call will have been doing for some time. And uh, what do we do with them? So we've got all of this is purely internal stuff at the moment, but increasingly we're providing them with access to cloudy things. So very commonly Office 365 type of things in our Microsoft world, but also lots of other SaaS applications, whether it be Salesforce or Workday or Dropbox or whatever it is that we feel we need to provide to our employees, we are pushing out that, that information to the cloud to enable our employees and our contractors to do what they need to do. So the cloud is beginning to appear in our picture. At the moment, central IT identity is very much front and center, and everything else is kind of dependent on it. So let's go another step. Here we have another line of complexity I was talking about, where our business units uh, are now more than one. So instead of just having Central IT ruling everything and understanding all the processes worldwide for every single business unit, we have multiple business units, possibly with multiple different directories in some cases, different help desk systems, different line of business apps, and so on. This particular picture is showing us consuming the HR identity is all from one central place, but of course even more complexity comes in when we have multiple HR sources, particularly when people start transferring between them. 
But again, this is where the complexity comes in. So we have complexity across a number of regional activities. They will need their own, they have their own systems, they have their own, therefore, technical implementations. That degree of complexity goes a step further. So I'll just let that come up. Okay. So here I'm just illustrating that on top of the need that local units have to have their particular systems provisioned by our central IT systems, they start to have varying needs in terms of the workflows they have. They then have different approval processes. They have different attestation processes. So I'm hoping that some of you are seeing yourself on this journey where you've got some sort of central identity activity going on and you're recognizing probably that increasing amounts of complexity are coming out of regional offices and when it gets to its logical conclusion, if you like, every regional office has its own systems and its own processes and its own everything, and we're struggling a little bit to provide the services in a timely and cost-effective manner. We can do it. Uh, this is all what this picture is showing is all still within the, the reach, if you like, of, of a central IT-focused system. Uh, but there's a good deal of complexity in this picture, and um, that's fine. We can deal with it, but it's increasingly complex. take it a step further. So now the cloud is all internal IT, well, which we just had using some cloud services, but it's all basically for our internal employees and contractors. The cloud comes along and the two are very related issues of mobility, so access to services from non-company provided, non-static, non-internal devices, so whether they're, or of course company provided, but classically outside the network and outside of our control to some extent. We have uh, the, that mobility need, and also the cloud services that people just want to use, they, they have a, a feeling that they need to get to their Dropbox, or they need to be able to use their Facebook account to log in, or whatever it is. So the expectations of the users have changed, and the capabilities that they're used to having have changed, and Central IT, to some extent, in, in some cases, is running to keep up with these expectations that mobility and cloud issues have awoken in our users, but also in our lords and masters who order services from us and say, why, why can't I do it like I do at home, sort of thing. So they need access to their apps from outside the perimeter and inside, of course. And also, because of our um, particularly ar arrival of lots of web services in general, our other communities have not been well served historically by central IT. So our customers, our members, our students, our external people of whatever sort, they are expecting to have some sort of access to data that affects them, whether it be their membership information or their pension rights or their health care rights or whatever they, even though they're not still working for us, they have some reasonable claim to some data that we should be providing them with. And they're looking to us to be a little bit more flexible and modern, if you like, than we have in the past. So the cloud has sort of moved the goalposts a little bit. We've probably got our internal stuff under control, but we're being presented with new challenges. And our perimeter is looking quite pockmarked with holes at this point. So our perimeter has, we have, we have all sorts of interesting approaches to publishing information. We have interesting approaches to making user accounts available. So we have directories inside perimeter networks. We have a, a, some sort of, maybe an AD or some sort of an LDAP directory in a perimeter network that can support some sort of logon. Well, we provided, of course, if we're super modern, we provided some federation services for people to come in from the outside to access our services, but our perimeter is not looking so much like a perimeter anymore, that's the point. So let's see where this takes us. So the communities, I'm going to look at people. Um, so yes, suppliers, what they're doing, they're accessing their catalogs, they're updating their bids, they're updating their data in general, what, what they are planning to provide for us. It's increasingly an activity that they'll do. Uh, partners, we're collaborating, we're exchanging documents in a secure fashion. I mentioned the sort of ex-employee type stuff. And the thing about customers, that last point there, is the scale, um, where we might have anything from, I don't know what, 5,000 to 500,000 internal employees of one sort, um, which we can pretty much manage with, a, with an internal uh, private network system, if you like, central IT historical legacy type system. Um, if we start getting into the million scale, so we've got 25 million customers, we're going to really struggle to both from a technical standpoint, from a scalability standpoint, but also from a process standpoint, 
to handle all of those accounts? How do we get them entered into the system if there's no self-service? You know, we've got to provide very easy self-services. We've got to provide self-registration. But we don't want to lose the ability to provide some sort of trust services on top of that. In other words, we do want to validate those accounts in some way. And this is all a bit of a challenge for, for us in, in central IT. So these are the communities we're talking about. And this is the other dimension of complexity that I mentioned. So one of the ways that we're going about this at the moment is that we use the cloud as an ID source. In other words, cloud systems, whether that be, um, let's, say, let's assume it might be something like Workday right now, uh, where we're actually managing our HR, not only in some on-premise HR system, but also possibly from a Workday type system in the cloud. So that might be providing us with some information about our employees. Um, in this scenario, we might be allowing some sort of federated access from other systems, from some sort of external identities that aren't actually present in our system but are recognized as trustworthy by our systems uh, on the basis of some sort of federation trust that we have. So we're beginning, this is again still a central IT managed service, this isn't really very cloudy, but we are, this is the, the impact of cloud if you like, we are being invited to consume cloudy, cloudy identities and give them access to our various things. And we can bolt those in, again, given the limitations of scale that we might have, we can accept those through our identity platform and uh, give them access to things. But then let's add a bit more scale. So we start to get identities who are what I would refer to as cloud-only identities. So this might be customers or suppliers who, who don't need access to systems that exist within our perimeter. It may be that all of the web activities that they will be consuming already exist in the cloud. They really have nothing to do with our internal network. Now this picture is showing them, I haven't drawn a perimeter on the picture, but everything we've seen so far apart from the cloudy clouds are inside an, an internal network, inside a, a perimeter. So we're inviting customers into the perimeter with their blue arrow. We're pumping them through our on-premises system and we're publishing them back out to the cloud so that we can go to collab on SharePoint 365, whatever we might be using uh, for collaboration. And they transited our perimeter in two directions without really getting any value from that. So we've, we've made our perimeter even more porous as far as these identities are concerned. They exist inside our network. They've really got nothing to do with our internal network. So just from a, it's a slightly academic point, but we have a slight feeling that that's not the way it um, should exist. So um, sorry, Pat, oh, I, I can see your question that you want to get to the how it works. We get to a little bit of how it works. Um, there's a little bit if it works to come, um, but I do want to establish the why for those who haven't come across it. So we, we do get to a bit of the how it works later. So um, what are we dealing with in terms of the limitations? Um, well, I've mentioned the really high volume of data. This is all about timeliness, really. If it takes us 24 hours to synchronize our data, uh, then we are not going to be very timely in responding to user requirements. And uh, we have some issues of, of overloading platforms. now. Tim has to hold its hand up here. Its synchronization, pl synchronization platform is single instance. Uh, there are things we can do to scale it out, but that leads to complexity. So we've got a very high volume of data. Um, key point here really is the processes. Um, if we're automating help desk type processes where a user makes a request, sometimes on paper, sometimes in a web, and it goes to a, a real person, and that real person has a look at it and enters it into some other system, or sometimes clicks through it to and open a ticket and do the work, um, then even if only some of the activities to do with an identity are at that level, then the processes are really not appropriate for high scale. And we find that the highly productive workers who have, who have high value activities going on, our internal help desk type processes are very appropriate for them. But for simple stuff like customers resetting their passwords and getting an email about it, it's just not going to work at high scale. Talked a bit about the appropriate appropriateness of authenticating people into our private network, um, whether we think that's appropriate or not, and um, how do we publish those? In other words, we've got lots and lots of identities from different sources. We want to publish them out to cloud SaaS act activities. Do we even have the technology? Do we understand how to do it? It may be a small subsection of our population who actually needs a particular application but we've still got to get into the technology to do it. So, 
Look at this so loud. It's a little bit salesy, but um, there is no doubt that the, the, the main benefit of cloudy sorts of services is that they are standardized and therefore cheap to provide. They're standardized and they're easy and they exist. They are just there and you switch things on the checkboxes. So we can do things like self-service personal reset very easily. We can provide multi-factor auth with telephone type integration or email type integration for a second factor very easily or soft tokens on mobile devices. Has the advantages of course of being designed in the cloud for the cloud. In other words, it is uh, very conscious of the fact that it isn't surrounded by a protective perimeter and so it uses standard protocols in a secure manner, at least it should do, and people are spending a good deal of time and money making sure that, that is the case. So we're not concerned about where the perimeter is in this diagram, if you like. Uh, we are dealing with the world outside the perimeter. And uh, we need, with our cloud support, we need access to or access from our various heterogeneous devices, so lots of mobile devices and so on. And increasingly, we're able, in a very, very simple way, we can use work, workplace join type activities. We can join a bring your own device, device to our cloud uh, activities. So the user said, if I come in from this particular device, which I've mentioned in the past and gone through a registration process for, I am more trustworthy than just coming in from some airport kiosk. And the cloud features that Microsoft in particular offer uh, involve a good deal of automated downstream SaaS applications provisioning. So I can get access, I think the last number I heard was something like 1,200, but it keeps going up. Uh, 1,200 different SaaS apps are just checkboxes away. So I say, if this happens, if this user becomes a member of this particular group or whatever, give them a box identity or give them a, a Dropbox account or whatever it is. So that's just a checkbox away. So these things, uh, this is a, a certain amount of, of scale activity, but a good deal of heavy lifting is just taken away from us and made available. As with a lot of cloud services, if it's what you want, it's great. If it isn't what you want, because you have various complexities and things, then having your on-premise complexity, if you like, which can handle interesting uh, enterprise processes, uh, that also has a place in the world. So here we've just shown a diagram of our focus on the cloud. So customers applies, we now manage using the uh, Azure Active Directory, AAD functionality that Microsoft is offering. This is our Microsoft view of the world. So those users go through workflows uh, for, for self-registration or uh, some form of moderated registration, going through and creating their identities in, a, in Azure Active Directory. We can check them against an internal database as they come on board to make sure that they provide a customer number or whatever it is and we're able to validate them against some sort of internal database, assuming relatively low value activity, and they get their active their AAD identity and access to Office 365 for collaboration or whatever downstream SaaS applications we have. And we have no activities to do from an internal central IT point of view, apart from configuring the services to give these people access to these downstream SaaS applications. And now we've got our internal people using a, uh, an internal system, our, our internally provided FIM system, and publishing those back out to the, the cloud. And we've got a cloud directory, so we've got two authoritative sources, if you like. We've got our internal source and our external source, and this is where the, the final part comes. The logical conclusion, the volume of data that we're handling in these scenarios, in these external act, uh, identities, is so much greater than our internal that it makes sense to use our uh, master tenant in, in Azure. We have multiple tenants, but we, have, we designate an Azure Active Directory as our master. Every, act, every actor in our system publishes its identities out to Azure AD through its various workflows. And those particularly on-premises solutions that need their own user lists and their own activities, they subscribe to that and they consume identities out of the cloud. So this is now inverted. The picture no longer has central IT at the top. Central IT is one of several business units at the bottom consuming these identities for its own particular purposes. And we get the services in this diagram that I was talking about. So we get, uh, for example, self-service password reset by the cloud from the external network outside the perimeter with multi-factor uh, checks to make sure that is the user concern. And that can apply equally for our external users, for our customers, but also for our internal users. And that password reset can be written back um, into our on-premises network. So this is the inverted picture. We mustn't 
forget that there are heterogeneous activities. Let's wait for a second. So we have other cloud providers who uh, we may need to deal with. So we may need to either to be setting up trusts with them, or in some cases actually publishing information directly to them through various APIs and so on. So the picture looks like that. Got a question about using FIM on-prem as our solution. The ultimate solution is, of course, a mixture. So a lot of the, the lifting is done by Azure Active Directory itself and its various features as part of reset and uh, in various scenarios. Uh, the, the B2C scenario allows us to do various uh, um, checks upon a, a registration that's coming in uh, against some database that we might nominate. So there are various activities that are simple checkboxes in the cloud. Um, and, and we are using in this, in this scenario for them on-premises to do the various high-value on-premise stuff that we need. There, are, there is some discussion in the industry around this, um, whether or not uh, a complex on-premise solution is still needed. Certainly the customers I'm talking to are not in a position just to put all of their activities into the cloud because of their processes, which require multi-level approvals or they require differential approvals depending on various bits of logic which the cloud solutions at the moment find it actually impossible to represent. So yes, FIM on-prem is part of the solution. I wouldn't say it is the solution, but it is definitely part of the solution. So there we have the inverted identity. Um, a, a question, um, we've talked about the uh, benefits. So we've got commodity cloud services that are simple. We have still have our high value central IT stuff going on on-premises. But for the relatively low value, high volume stuff, we've got a lot of scalability and flexibility. The architecture, importantly, is perimeter agnostic. In other words, every system is simply using standard APIs to talk to our Azure AD service, either with the publishing uh, identities or consuming them. And it is specifically intended to be device agnostic. In other words, I'm not concerned about whether you're using a domain joined Windows PC or whether you're using an Android tablet or an iPhone or whatever it is. So we find ourselves, just from an architectural design point of view, perimeter and device agnostic, which is, of course, an advantage. And we manage to keep our cloud-only identities out of our private network. There are some issues. Um, you need to do all of this stuff are not entirely complete. Um, we've got uh, an ongoing rollout, as I'm sure you're aware, from Microsoft in particular, of you know, every every six weeks we get new code and every sort of three months there's a big release of new cloud services and we are thoroughly aware of what's being developed. Not everything is available publicly yet that you need to do this. And uh, certainly when we come to some of the issues around, for example, publishing a, a website that for whatever technical reasons is currently hosted on premises, perhaps it needs access to back-end systems that are quite hard to traverse perimeters with, for example. Uh, we are already able, for example, to publish that internal web-based activity to our cloud-based portal so that our cloud identities get simple access to our on-premise web-based solution. There are some um, wrinkles around authentication that uh, we're looking to have ironed out on that. So there are some issues around uh, the existence of shadow Active Directory accounts in the internal network that we need to deal with. Um, but there are designs for those uh, going on, and there is a long and complicated discussion going on about whether we're going to get what we want to be able to do some of these things. But these are, to some extent, edge, edge, in, edge um, scenarios. I've got a question. The tipping point for enterprise to begin the move from Norm Barber. Um, so the tipping point, well, the two dimensions that I've talked about, so mobility and cloud, those are the things that typically bring the bring the, uh, the drive to, <clears throat> to address this issue. Um, as I say at the bottom here, I, this, this inversion picture is, is pretty much a long-term idea. If we think that is a way of managing our identities in the long-term future, it will take us some time to get there. We're not simply going to switch everything over you know, in a few months and say, right, as of now, everything is that way around, particularly if we have the uh, business unit complexity that I was talking about before. But we do need some uh, architectural thinking going on, and we need people to um, make a statement about where we want to end up. And we all know about the political and internal complexities of getting these sorts of things done. But making a statement about we plan to have a device agnostic and a perimeter agnostic 
identity management architecture. This is an important statement to be able to make because when you talk to people like CIOs, CIOs quite like the idea of being able to take a workflow that's currently running in our private network and publishing it into the cloud. Uh, but if our identity guys come along and say, well, we could do that, but then nobody could log into it until we build a complicated federation set up to deal with it or something, that uh, isn't good news uh, because the CIO is then inhibited from being able to just to reposition his workload as he sees fit. Whereas if we genuinely can say we are device and perimeter agnostic in our identity treatment in general, that gives us immense flexibility around workload. So the tipping point, well, the tipping point is for any, is usually already there, namely that these thoughts should start uh, soon if you are addressing any sort of mobility or, or cloudiness um, issues, particularly if you're dealing with these extended user communities. Now, running out of time, so we'll just do the last couple of slides. The, in future <laughs> webinars, we will get have to get into the, the, the detailed technical hows. Uh, I am raising the issue of the inversion because I believe it's a direction many organizations need to take. So it's about keeping an open mind and consider this for yourselves, your organizations. There are technical solutions to the things I'm talking about with some caveats that there are some things that are not quite there. We have other webinars coming up and there are a series of conferences coming up. So we will be dealing with these things further in the future. I will apologize if this wasn't technical enough for some of you. Um, but I think it's important to have the discussion about the overarching architecture and why we want to get there before getting into the deep tech stuff. So I will make a commitment to come up with a, a deep tech dive at some point into this stuff, particularly when it's finished, when the technology is available. But for now, I think that's all I have to say around the um, motion. If you'd like other webinar talks, by all means, request some. And with that, I'll hand back to Chris. We'll say some closing words, and I thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you, James. All right, as you guys can see here, there are, uh, there's a couple summits coming up. The OCG Annual European Summit in my favorite little uh, college town of Reading, England. Um, that's coming up in just over a month. And in the next slide, you'll see the Redmond Summit is coming up on the Microsoft campus uh, January 27th through 29th of next year. So that's, you know, we're coming up. Uh, on about a quarter until that occurs. You can get $150 off of that by registering by November 1st. Um, and you can register for that on OxfordComputerGroup.com and use the uh, coupon code SUMMIT15A to, at checkout to receive the bonus, uh, the checkout bonus rather. And uh, from there, the next slide goes into a few of our upcoming training sessions. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we do a lot of training I'm sorry, webinars are first. Um, so we have a number of additional webinars, as James had mentioned. Uh, so Connect Your Farm Enterprise with EMS is coming up uh, in a few weeks, as well as Azure AD for hybrid identity. Um, on the heels of that, in October, we have uh, the current PKI landscape, and you can understand uh, a number of threats that are uh, hitting that area in terms of uh, 2003 server end of life and many PKI implementations that are standing on top of that, as well as a lot of public key infrastructures that have been deployed on non-publicly routed certificates that will no longer be renewed in 2015. So there's a lot of work. For those of you who have PKI infrastructures, you will want to be in on that. And then more in uh, enterprise mobility uh, management uh, later in October. So from there, we, our upcoming training is, uh, as, uh, as you can see here, the FIM Foundation course, we've got one coming up in October, an advanced consultant course coming up in November, and then another foundational course in uh, December. And all of these, of course, as well as the upcoming webinars, you can see and register for on OxfordComputerGroup.com. So on behalf of Oxford Computer Group, I want to thank you for taking time out of your, your busy day. I know everybody's uh, time is valuable. and uh, Sorry we ran over a little bit here. I think this is very important for everybody in the identity space to understand where it's going and really digesting it. Um, but feel free to reach out to us. Uh, James and I, our, our contact information is on OxfordComputerGroup.com, and you can always uh, get a hold of somebody here at info at OxfordComputerGroup.com. And uh, from there, on the website, you can get next level detail on what we do, the technologies we specialize in, the training we provide, 
a uh, number of customer testimonials, white pages, blogs, all, all those fun things that, that we all love to spend our lunch times doing. Um, so, uh, and at the same time, you can get a copy of this presentation and a recording of this webinar as well as uh, past webinars. So with that, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.